Great. Uh, so please do stick around for Farhan, the deputy spokesperson, who will also have guests with him. Thank you very much, everybody. Over to you, Farhan. Thanks very much, Brendan. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first off, today is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. This morning, the Secretary General spoke at a virtual event to mark the day and said that the COVID-19 crisis has further exposed violence against women and girls to global emergency requiring urgent action. He reiterated his appeal to the international community to work to end the shadow pandemic once and for all, adding that the world needs to hear the voices and experiences of women and girls and take their needs into account, especially survivors and those who face multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. In his message for the day, the Secretary General also called for prioritizing women's leadership in finding solutions and engage men in the struggle. And my guest today, the Executive Director of the UN Population Fund, UNFPA, Natalia Kanem, and the journalist and writer, Isha Sise, will talk more about this topic with you. On Ethiopia, you will have seen in a statement we issued last night that the Secretary General is deeply concerned over the unfolding situation in the Tigray region and its surrounding area. Amid reports of a potential military offensive into the regional capital of Mekele, he urges the leaders of Ethiopia to do everything possible to protect civilians, uphold human rights, and ensure humanitarian access for the provision of much-needed assistance. The Secretary General also calls for the free and safe movement of people searching for safety and assistance, regardless of their ethnic identity, across both national and international borders. The Secretary General reiterates the full support of the United Nations to the initiative of the Chairperson of the African Union, President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa, to facilitate peaceful solutions. He urges all parties to seize this opportunity to de-escalate tensions. Also on Ethiopia, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that they continue to receive reports of people fleeing Mekele in search of safety. They tell us that violence and insecurity are also increasing in other regions of Ethiopia after the relocation of security forces to Tigray, with several reports of clashes and attacks in other places. More than 95,000 people are estimated to be newly displaced in the southern nations, nationalities, and people's region, following clashes reported last week. Food, water, and shelter are urgently needed in that region, as most of the displaced people are in open spaces. Our humanitarian colleagues also tell us that nearly 42,000 people have now crossed the border to Sudan. The UN and our partners have finalized our refugee response plan, and it calls for $147 million dollars to help a projected 100,000 refugees between November and June of next year. The Sudan Humanitarian Fund has allocated an additional $425,000 for the most immediate needs, such as health, water, sanitation, and hygiene, in the Umra Kuba camp in East Sudan. Kaula Mather, the Deputy Special Envoy for Syria, briefed the Security Council this morning. She informed council members that plans are being finalized for the fourth session of the Constitutional Committee's small body to convene from the 30th of November to the 4th of December in Geneva. The co-chairs further agreed to hold a fifth session in January 2021. She added that the constitutional track on its own cannot resolve the crisis. And the Syrian-led committee's work needs to be accompanied by mutual and reinforcing steps by Syrian and international players on the range of issues contained in Re Resolution 2024, 2254. Ms. McTire said that while falling short of the nationwide ceasefire called for by Resolution 2254, a fragile and relative calm continues broadly to hold in Syria. That calm, however, continues to be ever more challenged, raising concerns, she added. The acting Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator, Ramesh Rajasingham, told the, the Council that 6.7 million people in Syria are internally displaced and about a third of them lack proper shelter. He estimated that more than 3 million people across all of Syria will need assistance this winter because of their shelter needs. Also, he said, an estimated 9.3 million people in Syria are food insecure. That's 1.4 million more people than a year ago, and more than at any other time during the crisis. About 1 million of them severely food insecure, twice as many as last year, and we expect this number to increase, he warned. We've been asked about the elections in Burkina Faso, and I can say that the Secretary General commended, commends the people and government of Burkina Faso for the peaceful and timely holding of elections on the 22nd of November, despite the enormous security challenges in parts of the country. The Secretary General urges all parties to maintain the atmosphere of peace and respect that has characterized the process. He urges all parties to continue to uphold the code of conduct 
and allow the process to continue to its conclusion. He calls on all stakeholders to address any differences or concerns they may have through legal means. The Special Representative of the Secretary General for West Africa and the Sahel, Mohamed Ibn Chambas, in collaboration with the resident coordinator, is on the ground to engage with national stakeholders to facilitate dialogue. The UN remains committed to supporting Burkina Faso, and Mr. Chambas is closely collaborating with the African Union, the Economic Community of West African States, and other partners to support the electoral process. We have another update on the forthcoming elections in the Central African Republic. The UN peacekeeping mission in the country, MINUSCA, has organized a four-day civic education training workshop where leaders of civil society or organizations will engage with the electorate in the run-up to the elections on the 27th of December. The workshop, called Support Project for the Electoral Process, included 80 participants from 27 civil society organizations who will in turn conduct electoral training within their organizations and be deployed to the field to raise awareness about the election process. The training, which concluded yesterday, took place in partnership with the UN Development Program and in line with the mission's mandate to coordinate international electoral assistance. And today, the peacekeeping mission expressed its concern at growing tensions in the country. The mission called on Central Africans to consider the elections as an opportunity to consolidate the democratic process and to find lasting solutions to the crisis. The special representative of the Secretary General and head of the peacekeeping mission, Mankula Ndai, continues to use his good offices and to promote inclusive dialogue between political actors in order to ease tensions. The mission will also reiterate that it will fully carry out its mandate to protect the civilian population and institutions. Also, on the International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women, our UN teams around the world are promoting the 16 Days of Activism campaign. In several countries, some iconic buildings are being lit up in orange to raise awareness. In the Pacific, our UN team in Samoa, led by resident coordinator Simona Mananescu, joined authorities and civil society organizations for a joint European Union-UN spotlight initiative to tackle the urgent problem of violence against women. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, according to official figures, 86% 86 of women in Samoa experienced some form of violence, and half of all women between the ages of 15 and 49 reported to have been victims of physical violence. The UN and our partners are also concerned that in the past month alone, more than 90% of children between the ages of 1 and 14 experience physical or psychological aggression by their caregivers. The Spotlight Initiative is helping to address the issue at the community level. Village safety committees now include the chiefs, the church, and women's committees. Samoa's 16 Days Healing Campaign starts today and will be broadcast nationally and regionally. The UN Refugee Agency warns today that one of the consequences of the pandemic has been a renewed wave of violence against women and children, uh, women and girls who are refugees, displaced, or stateless. The Global Protection Cluster, led by UNHCR, reported increases in gender-based violence in at least 27 countries. The sale or exchange of sex as an economic coping mechanism was also reported in at least 20 countries. Participants in the assessment described an increase of intimate partner violence, resulting from tensions over containment measures, movement restrictions, and financial difficulties. UNHCR is also alarmed by increased risks of child and forced marriages. Echoing this year's theme for the 16 days of activism, UNHCR is urging donor support to preserve and boost essential prevention and response services. The UN Children's Fund today released a report showing that 320,000 children and young persons under the age of 20 were infected with HIV in 2019. This represents approximately one every 100 seconds, bringing the total number of children living with HIV to 2.8 million. The report warns that children are being left behind in the fight against HIV. In 2019, a little more than half of children worldwide had access to life-saving treatment. Nearly 110,000 children died of AIDS that year. And I have an announcement for you. Following the recommendations of the Secretary General, after consultation with member states, the General Assembly confirmed Filippo Grandi of Italy as UN High Commissioner for Refugees for a further two and a half year term beginning the 1st of January 2021 and ending the 30th of June 2023. While the Secretary General had intended to request the General Assembly to elect Mr. Grandi for a further term of five years, Mr. Grandi was agreeable, owing to personal reasons, to the shorter term. Mr. Grandi is currently serving an initial five year term as High Commissioner. Further on this is being mailed and posted as I speak. And I'm pleased to end on a positive note. Our thanks today go to Madagascar and Oman, where both have paid their regular budget dues in full, 
These contributions take us to 135 fully paid up member states. And tomorrow is Thanksgiving, so there will be no briefings. On Friday, we will not have a briefing, but we will be available to answer your questions. And we'll be back in the briefing room on Monday. So I'll wish you a happy Thanksgiving. And before we go to our guests, please let me know if there are any questions for me. I see a hand raised from James Bayes. James, you get to go first. Yes, Farhan, I've got uh, three different questions on three different subjects, if it's okay. Um, the first is on um, the pressing news on Ethiopia. Um, I heard what you just said um, in your opening, but that deadline of 72 hours and an imminent attack, the deadline's running out, the attack could be happening in the next hour or so. So how concerned is the Secretary General about that? And also, what does he make of the Ethiopian Prime Minister's comments that he wants, um, wants the international community to refrain from any unwelcome or unlawful acts of interference? Um, what's the Secretary General's view that the Ethiopian Prime Minister says it's none of your business? The Secretary General made his concerns clear uh, in the things we've issued, in the things we've been saying for the past uh, few weeks. Uh, and, uh, and in terms of the international presence, we've been very clear about the need in particular uh, for the African Union and uh, its as Chair uh, uh, President Ramaphosa uh, to be in the lead in dealing with this issue. And we've been supportive of their efforts. And we, of course, have also had our own involvement, including through our envoy, uh, Pakfe Onanga and Yanga. So we are going to continue with our efforts. We're going to continue to call for the protection of all people, all civilians. And we're continuing to study the situation in Mikhail. And uh, as I just pointed out, our humanitarian colleagues are already... Uh, trying to deal with the situation involving uh, people fleeing from the Kale and, and our worries that the situation could get worse. Uh, but, uh, but yes, our positions uh, continue to stand and we uh, are worried about this and, and we will uh, speak on this further and continue to act further uh, if uh, the situation worsens. Second question is about the UK. Um, it has abandoned, reneged on its pledge uh, to spend 0.7% of its national income on international aid. One assumes that will have impact on the humanitarian operations of the United Nations and its agencies. What is the UN's response to a member of the G7 um, who was making this bold pledge now reneging on it? Well, we'll have to get further details from the government of the United Kingdom, but... Uh, we have uh, been very clear about the need for more contributions. And, uh, and we've also been clear about our worries of any uh, signs of uh, donor fatigue at a time uh, when needs are so large as they are now. Uh, we certainly want all uh, 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 developed nations, all countries that are capable of doing so, to uh, uh, meet a 0.7% target. And we would regret uh, any, uh, any retreats uh, from that target. My final question, um, the permanent representative of Pakistan delivered a dossier to the Secretary General, um, which he says details things that um, India has been doing um, in the India-Pakistan border region to destabilize Pakistan. Um, the Secretary General, one assumes, has had a chance to look at that dossier. What does he make of it? Uh uh, we have received uh, this document, and, 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 it will, and it will be looked at. Uh, that's as much as I can say on that for now. Uh, Abdul Hamid, I believe you have a question? Abdul Hamid? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, my first question that yesterday... Ambassador uh, Munir Akram of Pakistan held a press conference and he said that he had handed uh, Tuesday uh, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres dossier on India's campaign to promote terrorism and subversion in Pakistan. And he urged him to interfere uh, with a New Delhi to stop this campaign. First, do you confirm receiving this dossier? And second, what is the uh, reaction of the Secretary General? Uh, 
Abdelhamid, even though Edie Letterer is not the person who beat you to the question, uh, your your colleague James uh, did ask the question in front before you just now. And uh, like I told him, um, oh, we've uh, received the letter and we'll and we'll study it. Uh, that's as much as a reaction as I have on that for for this moment. Sorry, I, I, I was unable to hear, so that's why I missed some of the questions. That's okay. Yeah. We'll all be in a room together, and and uh, and we'll uh, and and you won't have to worry about people cutting in front of you for the question. Uh, Maureen Picard, you have a question. Farhad, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can. Okay, great. Um, could you give us the latest on the uh, the situation with the uh, Ethiopian uh, peacekeeping troops, uh, the fate of this brigadier general, the number two of Ansfar, who was recalled and seems to uh, have disappeared without trace since, I believe, last week? And uh, is the secretary general uh, currently uh, reaching out in any way uh, to towards the Ethiopian government about this uh, very uh, worrying uh, development? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean we've uh, we've been very concerned about uh, the matter of uh, of uh, any uh, uh, possible uh, troops being sent uh, home uh, without the without the right uh, notifications going to our Department of Peace Operations. At the moment, we're ascertaining all the relevant facts, and we're in the process of implementing a number of steps in response. And we've been engaging with the Ethiopian government, including uh, through the permanent mission uh, in New York. Uh, regarding the deputy force commander of the ABA force, UNISFA, uh, we have received a communication from the Prime Minister of Ethiopia and are engaging with the Ethiopian government broadly uh, regarding the missions to which Ethiopia has contributed troops. And we can confirm that the deputy force commander of UNISFA applied for and granted leave uh, was still ongoing. Okay. Um, Richard, do you have a question? I do. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I missed this at the beginning, but do you have a uh, comment on the passing of Diego Maradona, who at one point was a UNICEF goodwill ambassador uh, in various years, uh, who passed away uh, a short time ago? Uh, it, it's, it's very sad to hear this news. Uh, he was an inspiration to many. Uh, and yes, uh, he did. Uh, he did work, uh, and and gained uh, did a lot of positive work for us as a goodwill ambassador. And uh, I think I speak for many when I say that sometimes it seemed as if he had been touched by the hand of God. Uh, and with that, uh, Philippe, uh, you have a question. Yes, hello, Farhan. Um, maybe I missed that, but um, did Mr. Gutierrez have? Any discussion with Mr. Biden or Mr. Blinken? Mr. Who? Sorry. Mr. Biden, the, the, oh. the new president. Uh, no. Because Mr. Biden talked to the Secretary General of NATO a few days ago and uh, nothing with UN, so it's very curious. Uh, no, uh, it, and that's uh, that's actually fairly standard for us, uh, uh, that... Um, that uh, we deal with one government at a time, and uh, at some point in the future, we will be talking uh, to uh, Mr. Biden. Uh, of course, uh, you're aware of our congratulations uh, to the president-elect. We're aware of the um, uh, appointments and the, the names uh, he, uh, he's uh, been uh, giving out for, for the key positions, and we look forward uh, to dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Biden's government once they're, once they're in place. Uh, uh, Mr. Sato, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, thank you, Hahan. Uh, I have a question about the, uh, the next U.S. government's commitment to the uh, climate change action. Uh, it seemed to me that the uh, next U.S. government will be backing to the Paris Accord. So what does the Secretary General expect for, expect for the next U.S. government? And... Uh, uh, also, the next month, there will be uh, the fifth anniversary of Paris Accord, which will be organized by the uh, UK government. What uh, is the uh, Secretary General's message for the international community uh, toward uh, next month's uh, uh, high-level meeting of the fifth anniversary of Paris Accord? Thank you. Uh, yes, the Secretary General uh, actually... Uh 
uh, met, uh, made comments yesterday in a roundtable, uh, leading a co uh, economist. And uh, he actually uh, looked ahead uh, to uh, the pledges countries have been making about carbon neutrality, that China uh, and uh, has uh, made a pledge uh, for carbon neutrality by 2060. You're aware of uh, uh, what we've said about uh, the government of Japan and other governments and their pledge for carbon neutrality by 2050. And he also said yesterday that he believes that in the beginning of next year, with the change of the, in the UN, U.S. administration, countries representing more than 65% of global emissions and more than 70% of the world's economy may have commitments to carbon neutrality. Uh, so he has said that now is the moment to have a quantum leap and have a global coalition for net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And that is uh, one of the messages he will be um, uh, bringing uh, forward uh, for the, um, of, uh, as we mark uh, the anniversary of the uh, Paris Agreement. And I'd also like to point out uh, that uh, next week uh, on December 2nd, he will have another uh, major speech on climate change that, that we've been uh, talking to you about. And, We'll we urge you to pay attention to what he has to say then. Is that is uh, oh Carla, you have a question? Yes, thank you. And yesterday at the briefing um, given by the ambassador of Pakistan, and the question uh, was discussed. Uh, you've got two nuclear armed countries um, between whom. Uh, Threats of violence are escalating, and this was a, a, a problem, a serious problem that the Prime Minister of Pakistan mentioned several years ago. The risk of an accidental uh, nuclear exchange is very great. So my question is, why is this issue not being, the Pakistan-India conflict, not being discussed at the Security Council, which spends an enormous amount of it, its time and energy on North Korea, which is basically defensive, whereas the possibility of an act, even an accidental nuclear exchange uh, between two um, extremely uh, hostile countries is a reality. And what does the Secretary General have to say about the fact that this is not being discussed? By this well. As you, know, as you know, the Security Council gets to determine its own agenda, so we have nothing to say on that. Regarding the Secretary General's views, of course, uh, he has been very clear about his stand on nuclear nonproliferation. You're aware of his encouragement of countries to abide by uh, uh, the various uh, nonproliferation non -proliferation treaties that are in effect, and, uh, and we stand uh, by that call today. Uh, Iftikhar, uh, 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 you have uh, you have a question, and then we'll let's go to our guests. If the guy. Thank you, Steph. Uh, obviously, my question has been asked by three people: uh, James, Abdul Hamid, and Carla. But uh, I would like to ask you about something else: uh, whether the UN has any information or comments on persistent reports that the Israeli Prime Minister visited Saudi Arabia and met. Uh, the crown prince. We're aware of the media accounts the same as you are, but uh, we don't have an official confirmation to make on that. So that would be uh, an issue for the relevant governments uh, to discuss. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And now uh, let me turn uh, to our guests.